Um, this is Kim 108. This is York College, April 21st, 2015. And we'll be continuing in Chapter 7. So we thought about quantization, right? And we thought about a whole bunch of different examples of how different properties of matter, of light, of different things are quantized. Um, so we <coughs> thought about, for example, the photoelectric effect and the work function and the kinetic energy of electrons. And we did a couple of problems, so you all know how to do that, right? Good. Um, we thought about line spectra, uh, um, these bright line spectra. Right. Has anyone done that lab yet? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good. So you know exactly what we're talking about. Right, and so you get, you see the spectra that look like this, and that, oops, and that um, <laughs> show, <coughs> tells you that the energy of electrons is going to be quantized, right, because you have specific lines, not, a, not a, just a whole spectrum. <coughs> um, I'm just trying to mess with you. Um, so, here we have one initial explanation of bright line spectra. And so Bohr, in 1913, take a, take a look at the dates that we've been looking at. They're all kind of around 1900. And so I think if you think about the kind of technology they had in 1900, right? This was before, was it before cars were invented? Probably not. but. Um, before cars were very widespread, right? Um, this was before there were, certainly before there were like computers. There's, you know, um, this was a long time ago, but they, 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 they were able to recognize a lot of these really strange and, and fascinating um, properties of matter. So Bohr thought about these uh, transitions, these, <coughs> the energy of electrons, and he developed a model. Now, <coughs> as we move forward in, in this class, we're going to be thinking a lot about different models, right, because um, an atom is something you can't see. Right? An atom is something, even with the, 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 the most powerful uh, microscope, light microscope, that you're not able to, to, to see it. And, but in order to understand it, it's very useful to be able to have something tangible to visualize or to think about and to grasp onto. And so we'll be thinking a lot about different models, models of atoms, models of bonding, models of molecules. And what, when we think about models, what we have to remember is that a specific model is going to be useful but very often limited. Um, and so the Bohr model was an initial attempt to explain things like line spectra. And it turns out it only works for a hydrogen atom. Um, and the principle, yeah, th it only works for a hydrogen atom. But they were stud hydrogen was the simplest atom, and it's what you know got studied quite a bit because it was the simplest. And the principles are kind of embedded into a lot of uh, atoms larger than hydrogen. So <coughs> here's the, the thought, right? So the thought here is that electrons can have only specific energy values. Right? That means the energy of the, the electrons are quantized. Because they can have only specific values of energy, or sp <coughs> um, when it goes from when the energy of the electron goes from one value to another, you can, for example, release some energy in the form of light. If it goes from a higher level to a lower level, energy must be conserved, so energy is, is given out <coughs> in the form of light. And that light, remember, the energy of light is defined by its frequency or by its wavelength. <coughs> um, and so that's why you get these single colors in your bright line spectrum. Each color refers to one electronic transition between different energy values. So light is emitted as an electron moves from one energy level to a lower level. <coughs> um, the 
reverse is also true. If light goes from, if an electron goes from a lower energy level to a higher energy level, that can be uh, accomplished by the atom absorbing light. And then it's going to follow this, uh, the energy in of the, uh, the energies of the electrons in the different energy levels are going to follow this equation here. So E sub n, so E is energy, n is, wi <coughs> n is which energy level, right? So n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. So E sub n equals negative Rh, where Rh is a constant called the Rydberg constant, times 1 over n squared. So n is what eventually becomes known as the principal quantum number. We're going to meet n a little, again, a little later and go kind of through that explanation in a little more depth. But n is the principal quantum number, or in this case, just the energy level. You know, what is it in the first energy level, the second energy level, and so on. <coughs> um, Because we can figure out what the energy is for n, and n can be any of these, right? We can find the energy. If we want to find out the wavelength of the light that's emitted when an electron goes from, say, n equals 3 to n equals 1, then what can we do? We can find e sub 3. We can find e sub 1. The difference between them will be the change in energy. And then we can work backwards using <coughs> um, e equals h nu or hc over lambda to get our wavelength, to get our frequency. We'll take a look at that. Right, so remember, this is what's going on. You have these discrete steps. And here's what you see, the different transitions that are observed in the um, hydrogen atom. The ones that fall in the visible range are called the Balmer series. They're going down to n equals 2. Um, and so the bright line spectrum of hydrogen, um, when you're looking in the visible wavelength, you're going to have a red, a kind of yellowish, blue and purple. Um, so <coughs> here's in math what I just said in words. So the energy of the photon that's emitted is going to be the change in energy as you go from one level to the next, right? One state to the next. So delta E is, delta anything is always finest, final minus initial. It's going to be the energy of the final minus the energy of the initial. What, well, what's the energy of the final? It's the energy of the n where you end up. What's the energy of the initial? It's the energy of the n where you started. Right, so energy of final equals that, energy of initial equals that. Right, that's exactly from here, there. And we put them together, whoa. And we put them together, we get this equation down here. Right, E equals R sub H times 1 minus N squared I minus 1 over N squared F. So here's a, here's a kind of a trick question. If delta anything is always final, final minus initial, how come in this equation it's initial minus final? Exactly. The h isn't negative anymore. The, the rh, yeah. The constant went from not negative to, or went from negative to positive. And when you go from negative to positive, you can, you have to do something else that goes from positive to negative or change the sign of something else. And how do you change the sign of this? You reverse the order. Right, 3 minus 1 is 2, two mi 1 minus 3 is negative 2, right? the sign changes. So it's Rh, positive Rh times 1 over n squared i minus 1 over n squared f. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, right, so for the red line in the Balmer series, right, for the red line in the Balmer series, <coughs> what's i and what's f? 
Right, i is 3, f is 2. <coughs> um, OK, so you know how to kind of read the chart. So yeah, that's OK. We can do this, right? So calculate the wavelength in nanometers. Nanometers tends to be, particularly when we're looking at uh, light in the range of visible UV, IR, um, what we can see and close to what we can see. Nanometers is a very good unit um, because it gives us nice numbers, right? usually in the hundreds things that we can deal with very easily. So calculate the wavelength in nanometers of a photon emitted by a hydrogen atom when its electron drops from the n equals 5 state to the n equals 3 state. Well, here's your, f here's your formula, right? The energy of the photon equals delta E equals R sub H times 1 over n squared i minus 1 over n squared f. So what's i in this case? Five, five. five and f is three. three. So <coughs> r is r sub h is r sub h. Right? It's a constant. Do you need to memorize it? No. Um, <coughs> but again, if you're doing it right, you'll probably have it in your head by the time the exam rolls around. Right? So two point eighteen times ten to the negative. 18th times 1 over 5 squared minus 1 over 3 squared. Before we proceed, let me ask you a question. What's bigger, 1 over 25 or 1 over 9? 1 over 9. So that value is going to be positive or negative? Positive. Negative. Something smaller minus something bigger. It's going to be negative. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe, yeah. And therefore it's, sorry? It's exothermic, exactly. So the same conventions apply here, right? <coughs> the release of a photon is going to be exothermic, right? And so the sign here is going to wind up being negative. So 120, and if we, you just plug in the values, you solve for 1 over 25, 1 over 9, and you get delta E equals 1 negative 1.55 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Question so far? OK, so we need to find the wavelength, because that's what the question asks for. And so E also equals HC over lambda. Right? H energy equals H nu, or HC over lambda. Now we have a numerical value for the energy. So when we do this, we have to be careful here. Right? We're go not going to use the negative sign anymore because the energy of the photon is not actually negative. Right? It's like saying, <coughs> um, you know, wh what does it mean that energy is negative? That means that energy is given out. Right? So from the point of view of the system, which is the hydrogen atom, the delta E is negative. But from the point of view of the photon, right, the photo photon is not part of the system. Right, the photon, <coughs> the, the system is the hydrogen atom. From the point of view of the photon, the, its, its energy is positive. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it, it can't have a negative energy. <coughs> um, so we're going to use, <coughs> solve for lambda, lambda equals hc over the energy of the photon, and we plug in h, we plug in C, we plug in the energy of the photon positive, and that gives us convert from meters to nanometers, 1280 nanometers. <coughs> um, what, mathematically speaking, what would happen if we left the negative in? Our lambda would be negative. Right? That doesn't make any sense. Right? It doesn't make any sense for a wavelength to be negative. So if you remember when we were talking about chapter 6, when we first introduced the signs with respect to energy, we said the signs mean something very specific. 
the signs very often when you're talking about energy are talking about directionality. Is energy going into the system or out of the system? It's going into the system, it's positive. It's going out of the system, it's negative. Questions here? For filter energy, does it always have to stay positive? Or, like, can you, for this case, when you have negative 1.5, are you saying that's work being done right by the system? Well, it's not work being done, it's energy being given off. Yeah. yeah, energy being given off. So does that mean when we plug it in, does it always have to stay positive? Or is there when we're trying to find the wavelength, we have to make it positive. Because when you're trying to find the wavelength of the photon, it's not from the point of view of the hydrogen atom anymore. It's from the point of view of the photon. And from the point of view of the photon, its energy is positive. Right? It doesn't have negative energy. Uh, um, yeah? So E photon doesn't really equal E delta E. It's really positive and Um. In, in some sense, you're correct. Right? The negative sign there is only there to indicate energy that's being given out. <coughs> um, so a photon itself never is going to have negative energy. Yeah. Um, but delta E can be negative because it's giving out a photon. Right? So now if you were to, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, another trick question. Let's say you wanted to excite the electron from the n equals 3 state to the n equals 5 state. What would delta E be? Positive, 1.55 times 10 to the negative 19th. Right? It would be the exact same because it's the same drop. It's the same distance. But it's in the opposite direction. It's going from low energy to high energy. The system is gaining energy. <coughs> and so you would have the same wavelength of light except instead of coming out of the system, it'd be going into the system. And um, have you guys done anything in lab with Beer's Law? Yeah. Yes. So you take an absorption, right? That's exactly what's happening when you do Beer's Law. Right? You set a wavelength on your thing, on your, on your device, and then you put your cuvette in with, and then you shine light into it and see whether it absorbs or not. Right? And if it absorbs, that means the electrons are being excited at that wavelength. OK, so <coughs> let's ask a different question rather than rather than finding the wavelength. Oh, by the way, what I just erased, your, your final is in 3D01. Right? So that's the big, giant lecture hall um, downstairs. Um, okay, so let's say calculate delta E if one mole of hydrogen atoms or one mole of hydrogen atom electrons, or electrons in the hydrogen atom, drop from n equals 5 to n equals 3. So what's this? This is the energy of a single photon that's associated with a single electron. And is that number big or small? It's very, very small. It's 10 to the negative 19th. So what this kind of question is doing is it's taking us from the submicroscopic world into the macroscopic world. Right? It's very, it, not impossible, but it's very hard to do single uh, atom or single electron measurements. What's much easier to do is do measurements on a sample that you can weigh out or you can take a volume of or something. So if we have one mole of hydrogen atoms, 
that's doing the same transition, what are we going? How? How? how what additional? <laughs> what additional um, calculation do we need to do? Change find molecules of hydrogen atoms. Find molecules of I know what you're saying. Um, so yes, find the. We have to go from one photon to a mole of photons, right? So this is. It's really what joules per one atom or one photon or something per per atom. Because that's what we're looking at, right? We're looking at one atom. <coughs> what we want to do is say 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. And so when we put that together, what we're going to get is Anybody have an answer? Six point oh two times one point five five equals negative nine point three three times ten to the fourth, right? Times ten to the fourth joules per mole. So one mole of hydrogen atoms is going to give you a delta E of negative 9.33 times 10 to the fourth joules, or negative 9.33 times 10 to the one kilojoules. Questions? Okay, so this is going to give you the joules per mole. So you could you could do you can multiply by five. You can multiply it by five. Either multiply this by five or multiply this by five. It'll give you the same answer. Yeah. This is kind of this is kind of um, not central to to the concept here, but if you have a, a whole sample of some material where the uh, electronic energy level is going from one state to another state all at the same time. Does anyone know what that's called? If you, if you actually had something like this where a whole sample of, uh, of, a, of a some material <laughs> is undergoing the same electronic transition at the same time. It's, it is going from an excited state to, a, to, to another state. I mean, this is two excited states, but yeah, it's going through. <coughs> but what you would be doing is you would, getting a whole bunch, you would be getting a whole bunch of light with the same wavelength, right? So that's one characteristic, anyway, of what's known as laser light, right? So laser light gives you a very pure color and the reason for that is it's the concerted change, <coughs> the change altogether of one, um, fr uh, uh, from one state to another state. So like all the electrons in your laser are going to be going from one state to the other state, to, to uh, going from the higher state to a lower state all at the same time. I mean, there's other characteristics of laser light, but that's uh, one of them. And that you get this uh, simultaneous drop from all your, uh, from all from all the atoms. Um, so, in the study of sort of electronic and other quantum transitions, laser light is often used because you can control, you can get a single wavelength. Um, you know, light from here is going to be a whole bunch of different wavelengths, right? It's the if it's white, it's basically the whole colored spectrum. Even those discharge lamps, right, that you use, in, that you look at in the in the lab, they're not a single wavelength. There's several wavelengths put together. 
Okay, so this we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And so, okay. So line spectra, Bohr atom explains at least to a certain extent how line spectra work. It works for hydrogen atoms. That formula, although some of the principles still exist, that formula doesn't work for um, electron for, for atoms that are more complex than hydrogen atoms. Okay, so right, so the black body told us that the energy of electromagnetic magnetic waves is quantized. It's from the heated solid black body that we get Planck's constant, right? We get H. The photoelectric effect tells us that electromagnetic uh, energy, such as light, is also quantized, right? <coughs> Line spectra tells us that matter has quantized properties in the form of quantized energy levels in electrons. So we have waves, we have matter, they're all kind of related. <coughs> it became evident um, eventually that matter at the very, very small scale also had properties that were like waves. Right? The photoelectric effect says that light has properties that are a little bit like matter. <coughs> um, De Broglie, 1924, so this is about 10 years later, he said, okay, can we, we can imagine, well, why is the energy of electrons quantized, right? So it is, it has specific values that can exist, but why does that have to be so? It wasn't, it, it wasn't kind of immediately understandable why, right? Um, and so de Broglie took some of the concepts that were floating around at, at his time and said, okay, if light can behave like its individual particles called photons, then maybe matter, like electrons, ha can, can behave like a wave. And that would give, ac according to his reasoning, that would give, um, ri give rise to quantized energy levels. And so, this is kind of the idea here. So if, if you wanted to uh, propagate a wave, and so here, the, the, the idea still is that electrons, and we'll see this isn't quite true, the idea is that electrons are kind of go around in orbits around the nucleus, right? That's kind of the idea that he built off of. And he was saying, well, if you have a wave going around a circle, how can that wave sustain itself? Well, it can sustain itself if it's what's called a standing wave. That is, the beginning of the wave and the ending of the wave are the at the same point. And so here we would have a standing wave. It just kind of goes around and around and around. Here's the, op here, here's the alternative. Right? Here, if you start here and you go around and around and around, then all of a sudden you come back. You're not at the same point. Right? And then if you're not at the same point, what's going to happen is they're going to start canceling each other out. <laughs> right, and so if this is positive and then this goes down, this is neg negative, those two are going to cancel each other out. The wave is eventually going to disappear. That, that, that can't be, otherwise, it, you know, if those were our, our electrons, we'd be gone, right? So he reasoned that, we have to, he, that, that you have to get these standing waves. And again, there was some truth in what de Broglie posited, but it was, it was limited. And so... He um, set forth a, a bunch of equations that <coughs> um, give rise to basically this here. So <coughs> um, the wavelength of the standing wave must equal E h, which is still Planck's constant, divided by m, which is the m mass of the particle in kilograms, times its speed. And de Broglie re reasoned that, okay, electrons can have a wavelength associated with them. And actually, any kind of matter can have an, a wavelength associated uh, with them. So, <coughs> um, 
<coughs> so we like to do these kind of fun calculations um, that say, okay, let's find the de, Brog de Broglie wavelength associated with you, right, if you were running at, you know, five miles an hour or something like that. <coughs> um, so this is something that's much smaller than you. Um, the, Br the De Broglie wavelength associated with a 2.5 gram ping pong ball traveling at 15.6 meters per second. Right, so the f formula is lambda equals h over mu. h is in joule seconds, m has to be in kilograms, and u is the velocity in meters per second. So all we have to do here is convert mass from grams to kilograms. Right, so 2.5 grams is going to be 2.5 times 10 to the negative third kilograms. And so you're going to get 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th, that's your h, divided by your mass in kilograms times meters per second. And when that all works out, you're going to get a wavelength equal to 1.7 times 10 to the 32 meters, or 1.7 times 10 to the negative 23rd nanometers. Is that big or small? That's very, very small, right? And then as the mass increases, what happens to the wavelength? Mass is in the denominator, right? So if the mass increases, the wavelength becomes even smaller. Right? So if you get to something, so, so, so the point here is that the wavelength is uh, associated with macroscopic bodies is so small that, you know, they're, they're able to be ignored. So, despite the fact that de Broglie was later proved to be, you know, th this model is not a model that's in use anymore, <coughs> um, it had some kind of logic to it, right? So, um, electrons had wavelengths that were reasonable, you know, in the, uh, you know, several nanometer range, whereas, depending on the speed, of course, Whereas macroscopic, uh, uh, macroscopic items, such as you and me and ping pong balls, had these wavelengths that were really tiny and couldn't be observed. And so, the main, or one of the main points that comes from de Broglie is that matter indeed does behave with wave-like properties. But it's much, much more complicated than what he, he, he set forth. And so, okay, so we're adding something here. The de Broglie wave was the first attempt to explain how wave properties could be associated with matter and how that gives them quantized energy levels. Like I just said, it turns out that that, 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 that particular model was quite incomplete. <coughs> um, and... The more complete model um, is something that, uh, if you become a, a, a chemistry major, um, <coughs> I asked you this already. Who, any, any chemistry majors here? Well, why not? Yeah. Oh, very good. <coughs> um, if you take uh, physical chemistry two, you spend a lot of time thinking about and uh, energy and wavelength, uh, energy and waves and wave functions and <coughs> the, the, the complete picture. Um, we'll just give you a very brief taste of that complete picture in what's called the Schrodinger wave equation. So 1926, so this is a couple years after de Broglie, right? <coughs> Schrodinger wrote an equation that described both the particle and wave nature of the electron. And that can be described, or that involves an entity called a wave function. Now, the wave function is a mathematical function that describes the energy of anything, in this case, energy of an electron, and the probability of finding that electron within a volume of space. And so, what this slide is trying to do is trying to give you a very brief introduction without actually doing any of the math, right? So Schrodinger's equation 
you know, can't, can't be solved for multi-electron systems, only for hydrogen atoms. And the short story of it is that um, each electron, um, you could say, is going to be associated. This is a Greek letter called psi. Each electron is going to be associated with its own psi. And, the, it's, and that psi is going to have some properties that are wave-like um, and some properties that are very much not wave-like. So, or it's going to describe an um, electron in a way that's not limited to understanding it as a wave. <coughs> um, and so This is what you need to. This is what you're you're going to kind of wh wh what we're going to focus on, right? We're not going to. We don't have the tools at this point in Chem One to do the math to understand um, all about wave functions. But we do have enough understanding to, or we do have enough well math or or background to understand what the result is, and the result is this, right? Psi, the wave function, is a function of four numbers, right? S and the four numbers are called quantum numbers. Those quantum numbers have names n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. And yes, n is the same n that was, in, 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 in spirit anyway, it's the same n that's in the Bohr atom. So the principal quantum number is n, and n and what you'll find is that these quantum numbers have specific rules about them. And so each electron is going to be described by a function of four, four numbers. And the numbers are going to be different for each, depending on the electron. So n can, is allowed to have the values of 1, 2, 3, or 4, and so on. Whole numbers, starting with 1, positive whole numbers. And n indicates the distance of an, elect of an electron from a nucleus. So in the Bohr atom, n told us something about the energy of the electron. Right? The higher the n, the higher the energy of the electron, the higher the state of the electron. <coughs> and so this kind of makes sense. Right? The higher the energy, the further away it's going to be able to get from the nucleus before the positive charge of the nucleus kind of reigns it in. And so the higher the n, the, f the, the further the distance from the nucleus. And so here are three examples of wave functions that are similar in some ways, but are different in that the, s, the, in that the n is different. Right? So here's n equals 1, here's n equals 2, here's n equals 3. And what's gray is the area in which you're likely to find an electron. Remember, the wave function describes the probability of finding an electron in, in, in a certain area of space. So for n equals 1, you have a small amount of space. For n equal 2, you have a bigger space. For n equal 3, you have a bigger space. And if your electron is somewhere in here, its average distance from the nucleus is going to be much bigger than if it's over here. Right? The average distance from the nucleus is going to be quite small n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Right. L is what's called the angular momentum quantum number. And L depends on n. Right. So once you have an electron and it's the electron is in, has a defined n, then you can start thinking about its L. <coughs> and so L can be any whole number starting from now 0 n started from 1, but L can be any whole number starting from 0, and it can go up to n minus 1. Right? So if n is 3, L can be 0, L can be 1, L can be 2, because 3 minus 1 is 2, n minus 1. And so for n is, equals 1, L equals 0. For n equals 2, L can be 0 or 1. For n equals 3, L can be 0, 1, or 2. <coughs> 
And the value of L tells us something about the shape of the space where the electrons allowed to <coughs> is likely to be found. So in the previous slide, we saw three spheres, right? Three giant three-dimensional circles, small, medium, and large. That's one shape that can be associated with a wave function. And so, and you notice that it said 1s, 2s, and 3s. We're going to talk about those, those, des those letter designations. But if L equals 0, <coughs> your electron is contained in what's called an s orbital. If L equals 1, it's contained in what's called a p orbital. If it's in L equals 2, it's contained in what's a d orbital. L equals 3, it's what's contained in an f orbital. And that's really all we'll, how, as big as, that's really the largest L that we'll, we'll think about in this class. Um, so, these orbitals are associated with different shapes, right? And so, remember, the N tells us distance, how big or how far from the nucleus your electron is. L tells you what shape orbital it can be contained in. And so, it has to do with the shape of the volume of space, right? So s orbitals are going to be spherical, right? That's what we kind of saw already. L equals 0. L equals 1. You're going to get basically dumbbell shapes, this kind of two-lobe shape <coughs> um, of where your electron could be found. Right, so the average distance of a 2p from the nucleus is going to be similar to the average distance from the nucleus of the 2s, except the 2s is going to be in a sphere found in a, this spherical region. An electron that has L equals 1 is going to be found in this kind of p, <coughs> kind of dumbbell shaped. And so you can see the three, <coughs> there's going to be three of these, we'll see why shortly. Right, and the three of them correspond with the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So we can call them px, py, and pz if we want. Right? D orbitals have these kind of funny shapes. Um, <coughs> there's five of them. Um, you should be able to recognize what a d orbital looks like, um, but we're not going to memorize kind of the names associated with them. Um, there are these generally these four lobes structures plus this one, which is uh, kind of interesting. And then f orbitals have very strange shapes. Um, <coughs> you can look them up if you want. Usually, usually kind of eight lobed, um, but we're not even going to try to draw them at this point. Okay, so once you have n and l set, then you can start to think about m, what's called m sub l, the third quantum number. It's called a magnetic quantum number. And m sub l depends on l. right? So for a given value of l, m sub l can go from, that's an l, not a 1, negative l to positive l. So if l is 1, well, if l is 0, then m sub l must be 0, because it goes from negative 0 to positive 0, which is just 0. If L is 1, M sub L can be negative 1, 0, or 1. Right? If L is 2, M sub L can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Right? Right. And so on. And L gives you the orientation of the orbital in space. So let's, I know this is all coming at you very fast, but let's think about if you have N equals 2. If n equals 2, l can be 0 or 1. Right? If n is 2 and l is 1, then l is a p orbital. Right? L, l is, repre represents p orbitals. And the p orbitals can go from negative 1 to 1. Two slides ago, what did we see? We saw there were three p orbitals. And those three p orbitals were basically identical except for the direction they were facing. One was on the x-axis, one was on the y-axis, and one was on the z-axis. It defines the orientation of that orbital in space. So you could have x, y, and z. 
right? And then the d orbitals we had one, two, three, four, five, right? We had five different ori orientations in space. Right, so your p orbitals, three orientations in space, corresponds to m sub l equals negative one, zero, or one. Five orientations in space, negative two, negative one, zero, one, or two. And the last quantum number is m sub s. It's called the spin quantum number. <coughs> this one is not that complicated. Spin quantum number can be for an electron, either plus, one half, or minus one half. <laughs> right, and that's kind of associated, it's a little bit confusing because the m sub s is called the spin quantum number, m sub l is called the magnetic quantum number, but the spin quantum number is very directly associated with, or, or can be, well, let's not say very directly, can be associated with like um, the poles of a magnet, right? So you have <coughs> um, essentially here two identical magnets, except one is in one or one up, and one the other one is down. And so very often, when we look at m sub s, that's plus one half, minus one half, but we often say spin up and spin down <coughs> um, to represent plus and minus. And they're going to be quite identical until you apply a magnetic field, right? And so you're going to have, if you have your electrons, they're all identical except for the m sub s. <coughs> they're going to be identical except until you apply a magnetic field. And then half of them are going to be m plus one half. Half of them are going to be m minus one half, m sub s minus one half. OK, so this is basically where we're going to stop in this, this slide. So the existence and the energy of an, remember, we just went through a whole bunch of rules, but we have to remember what we, these rules mean, right? They describe electrons, right? So if you have an atom with an electron, each electron is going to be described by a unique wave function psi that has a unique set of quantum numbers, right? So each electron is going to have its own set of n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. In other words, no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. This is what's called the Pauli exclusion principle. And so it's kind of like the quantum numbers can be kind of be viewed like you know, this is kind of a funny picture, right? This is supposed to be like a football stadium, and these are the, you know, this is the football field, and this is the, the crowd. <coughs> when you're, if you go to a football stadium, you get a ticket, your ticket's going to have some information. It's going to have, like, a section, uh, uh, it's going to have a row, and it's going to have a seat, right? So you can think of your quantum numbers as each quantum number as um, increasingly giving in increasingly specific limitations to your electron. Just like, you know, first you have to go to the stadium, the right stadium, then you go to the right section in the stadium, then you go to the right row, then you go to the right seat. But you have to go to the right, if you're thinking about an electron, you have to go to the right principal energy level, then you have to go to the right um, right L, right, then you have to go to the right orbital, then you have to go to the right spin. Okay, we're going to take a deep breath, we're going to stop there. <coughs> um, once we move a forward a little bit, we're going to see why these quantum numbers actually make a difference, why they matter, why we have to learn about them. And it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, for now, let's take a break. And then after that, we'll do something or other.